Hello and welcome to Bajaj Exam Prep IAS. As part of a comprehensive news analysis today, we'll be discussing seven to eight important topics related to your preparation. Before we begin, we have a very important announcement for today that on 26th March, this Sunday, we will have our national scholarship test on at 11 a.m. itself. You can register for it by the link given in the description below. But the most important part about this national scholarship test is that you can get up to 90% scholarship to become a part of our family. But more than that, you also get a detailed analysis of your strength and weaknesses in the way we give you the result of this test. So I would expect you to give this national scholarship test and become a part of our team and our family in that sense. And with this, we can enter into the eight topics we discussed today. The first is the IPCC report. We've discussed IPCC yesterday also, but that was a minor report. This is a major report which we need to discuss and a very important set of words which it has introduced. Thereafter, we have to discuss how TB, tuberculosis, can be ended in India. Very interesting article with regards to the way forward. And Stop TB, a meeting is going to happen in a conference with regards to that is going to happen in Varasi tomorrow. So it is a very well-timed article. Thereafter, Russia and China, there's a spectacle which has been created with regards to Xi Jinping meeting with Putin just yesterday. And we need to understand the implications of that. Thereafter, four to five very small but important topics. For example, the Cobra, Cobra Warrior exercise. Thereafter, ISRO now telling us the basic timeline for Chandrayaan 3 and Aditya 1. Thereafter, millets getting introduced into the diet of our soldiers. A mathematics award and last but not the least, Solomon Islands and what China has been able to do there. So, good morning to all of you. As I said, on Sunday, a very important national scholarship test for you. Do do that and please do like, share and subscribe to the channel. And on the Telegram channel, we will have a MCQ based test for this discussion. So that as soon as this session is over, you can revise there. So do like, share and subscribe to our Telegram channel also. With this, let's enter into the first topic, which is the synthesis report of the IPCC. Now, yesterday itself, we discussed that how the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC itself, does not do research itself, but is actually based on other research happening across the world. And it has now published its synthesis report on the sixth assessment cycle in Interlaken in Switzerland. And before again, I go into the nitty gritty. It's a very interesting report. And for the first time, we see the quantum of damage which we've already done to the environment. And therefore, therefore, this discussion is about two things. First, to understand what is the current situation and what is the implication for India. So when we talk about the current situation itself, the report tells us, and it's a very bleak picture, what the Paris Climate Agreement had said that we need to keep, we need to keep, the climate warming to less than 1.5 degrees Celsius. If we don't, if we don't, then there will be irreversible damage, which will in turn lead to a cascading effect. And that, ca that cascading effect itself will lead to irreversible climatic change, which will be based on extreme weather events. Now, what the report tells us is that we have already reached 1.1. We've already reached 1.1 degrees Celsius. We've already reached 1.1. So, basically, we have only 0.4% or 0.4 degrees Celsius to actually play with. So, because we have not been giving that much attention and generally, not giving heed to the reports and generally the IPCC, we have now made sure that our room to play with is basically 0.4 degrees Celsius. So the scientific community has been saying that 1.5 degrees Celsius is a tipping point. After that, we will never be able to come back to it. We have been listening to this 1.5 degrees Celsius, 1.5 degrees Celsius, but 
the report tells us that we've already reached 1.1 degree Celsius warming. And if it goes over that, then there is no stopping going 4 degrees Celsius, 5 degrees Celsius, which will technically burn the earth. So therefore, the first thing we get to know is a bleak picture that we've already reached 1.1 degrees Celsius and still the West, most developed countries have no real understanding of what to do about this issue. Because still everybody is looking for more sources of energy. We are going for what are called green projects, but not the way we should be going. The COP21, the general UNFCCC, both have become redundant generally and basically this is an eye-opening moment for us that we have only leverage of 1.1 degree Celsius and there is a playroom of only 0.4 degree Celsius. This is a concerning news. This is a concerning news because this means that basically if we don't take this seriously now, then there's no coming back. If you remember, we used a word yesterday, a closing window of opportunity. Now this window is very small. We had a window of 1.5 degree Celsius, but now that window is 0.4 degree Celsius. And this is a very, very concerning aspect of this report. This is the first thing which the report points out. Thereafter, the second thing is, what is the solution? What is the solution? What are the basic terms this report is using? Because for us, our preparation, we need to put in these words into a mains question. Now, the first, the word which it uses is, is that mainstream effective and equitable action. Very big words again, the IPCC reports always does this, that it gives big, big terms. Mainstream effective equitable action. What do you mean by this? What do you mean by this is, equitable meaning everybody has to act. Everybody has to act. And effective action means that basically your actions can't be on the fringe. It has to be mainstream. It has to be significant. It has to be big action. It can't be small, 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 small steps. The period of doing small steps is gone. So therefore, it has to be mainstream, effective and equitable. Equitable across the board. So the first point we get to know is that basically we have now reached a point where we already have a very small window of opportunity. And within that, what we need is equitable action that to mainstream and effective which in itself right now we don't see the political will for because with political conflicts, with border conflicts, with territorial conflicts, everybody is already obsessed with either coming out of recession or trying to stop deflation. Banks are failing. Generally, our concern right now is not the environment. And that is the problematic aspect here that somehow still when we have 0.4 degree Celsius to play with, we still are not serious about this issue. Because these reports come and they go, but we don't give a lot of attention to them. Then further, it says that if we don't stop this basic movement towards 1.5 degree Celsius, we are going to make sure that food security is going to now become a major concern for a lot of countries because the more the heating, the more the greenhouse effect, the more the global warming, our crops will start to fail. And when the crops will start to fail, there will be an issue with regards to how the vulnerable sections of society and generally understand this, generally how do we meet our food resources? Because the population is rising but the way we are producing our crops is not. So the yield is going down whilst population is rising. Therefore, vulnerable countries, vulnerable sections of society, how will they get, get access to food is going to be a major course of concern and a major understanding which needs to be highlighted to everybody. That food insecurity 
is the new word which is going to come into vogue but again we are not serious about this issue now how do you mitigate it how do you mitigate it and then we'll go into the nitty gritty of the topic itself the mitigation it is technically saying is that are basically two things first is financial investments the aspect it is trying to argue is that we have to somehow we have to somehow invest in green projects renewable energy and make sure that our emissions go down in this central banks financial institutions have to play a very important role because they have to push the projects and the development and the growth in a certain direction therein comes the larger argument of the article itself or the report itself which is that development needs to become more and more greener and sustainable and that mitigation process has to be based on very proactive effective equitable action the concept of equitable action is what i'm trying to emphasize here because this is the word which will go into your mains answer wherein equitable action is now the new word which has been introduced by the ipcc wherein they're talking about equal action by everybody it cannot be india it cannot be just china it cannot be just brazil it cannot be just the countries which are developing developed countries also have to develop a certain mechanism through which they can create a regime in which there is effective mainstream action so the two basic things which are there first that we are not taking this seriously we are obsessed with certain things which are immaterial if the earth does not survive the window of opportunity has become very small and the way we mitigate it is equitable action mainstream and effective however we don't see the seriousness at any level with regards to governments because everybody has their own obsessions everybody has their own issues and everybody has their own conflicts and therefore the more the wars the more the emissions the more the way we are pushing ourselves into this small opportunity to make it to 1.5 degree celsius once we reach 1.5 degree celsius there is no coming back this point nobody is ready to understand as of right now so i hope that you understand the basic point of this article these two points which is how do you mitigate it the new words which it has introduced and second the closing window of opportunity is actually very small window not a very big window perfect so the report emphasizes on the need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions adapt to what we call as human caused climate change through mainstream effective equitable action for a livable sustainable future for all again very big words and this is the problem sometimes you have to be more direct but this report will always talk about this diplomatic words livable sustainable future for all big 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 words but again has no real purpose for states for everybody all does not exist right now we believe in our own interest in our own national interest and one thing which this report has also pointed out is that climate change does not even if just does not affect people it has an economic cost the governments are coming to grapple and are grasping this concept of economic cost but they're not taking it that seriously they should so basically economic costs are something which this report is always talking about that climate change is not an abstract concept climate change impacts your economy climate change has a cost but still people are ready to give that cost vis-a-vis -vis other forms of development and we again yesterday had a discussion with regards to environmental cost what is the cost of development what is the cost of economic development and where do we draw the line that this is not enough or this is more than enough and this problem and this concept is where every country is ready to compromise for economic growth vis-a-vis -vis environmental growth so the report highlights the drastically drastic drastically increasing emissions and more than that we have already warmed the earth 
to 1.1 degree Celsius to pre-industrial levels. And this means that there will be risk to human health, fortunes and ecosystems because the last time we had this major report coming through in 2018, we were still in that bracket of 1.5 degree Celsius. We had that whole 1.5 degree Celsius with us. But now the IPCC is telling us that we've already warmed to 1.1 degree Celsius, which means that our leverage is only 0.4 degree Celsius, which is not a very big window. Because if we've reached within two years 1.1 degree Celsius, it will not take us more than six months to cover this 1.5 degree Celsius. Therefore, the global surface temperature is increasing. It is leading to extreme weather events and we need to take this very, very seriously if we actually have to understand the larger perspective. Now, noting that surface temperature increase, greenhouse effect and climate change is going to have a major impact on everybody. The more problematic aspect of climate change right now is that people will become will become more susceptible to food insecurity and the vulnerable populations will have disproportionate access to food and generally it will be, be borne by the people who don't have access to resources because if climate change is going to tip over a certain point it will be the vulnerable and the poor who will have to pay the biggest price in that sense. Last but not the least, it also talks about economic loss and damage incurred due to climate change. But as I said, right now everybody is ready to give this cost vis-a-vis -vis anything else. So for an equitable action, everybody should understand the economic cost. But America, the West, Generally, everybody is ready to give this economic cost vis-a-vis -vis environment, the, the environmental preservation. So they are like, okay, we are ready to give this cost, this environmental cost. The economic cost is enough for us to technically go forward. And it's not that it is a small amount. We believe that close to $200 billion worth of damages happen every year because of extreme weather events which are generally linked to climate change. So it's not that it's just a abstract concept. There is a tangible material impact to this concept itself. Then further, how do we move ahead? This is where your mains answer comes through the way forward section or the conclusion section. And herein the concept is we need to talk about climate resilient development. Now this is not a new word which is that development should be climate resilient, which is that if we do cross this one, 1 1.5 degree Celsius, if we do cross this 1.5 degree Celsius, thereafter, there needs to be resilience in our economies, in our infrastructure to take this much level of stress. And we also need to make sure access to clean energy, air quality, employment, healthcare, technology, everything needs to come together to adapt to climate change. Now you can see a pessimism here. You can see a pessimism here wherein somehow the IPCC is also given up. They are saying we don't think that we are meeting this 1.5 degree Celsius target and most probably now let's make our development climate resistant or climate resilient which is that let us make sure that our healthcare, our energy, our infrastructure can take the brunt of climate change. This is the pessimism and this is the very bleak outlook this report has itself. Further, it talks about how financial investments into climate goals, specifically green projects, is very, very important because only when there are financial incentives or disincentives for reduced emissions, scaling up, climate resilient and green projects, then only something is going to happen because in this world only one thing works, which is money. Money is important. Capital is important. Only when the capital is poured into these green projects, then only we can see something as a form of positive development. So now for India, what is the implication? 
the implication is very simple and again you can see that the report itself has already given up that the priority of India should be to minimize loss and damage in terms of lives, livelihood, biodiversity, accelerate equitable action and India can do one thing for sure is that because we are developing right now we can have a low per capita emission development path but we already are a very very small small country when it comes to emission per capita so the basic point of the matter is what is this article trying to talk about before we go to TB see three very simple things first you can see the tone of the report the tone of the report is we give up we've already reached 1.1 degree Celsius the window of opportunity is 0.4 percent a 0.4 degree Celsius and as of right now the tone of the report itself very simply says very simply says what it says do climate resilient infrastructure development and for India minimize damage this is not good this is something which technically is a very dangerous precedent which this report is technically putting through which is that we have given up we have given up let's make sure our healthcare our education sector our employment and our access to energy is clean enough and resilient enough now it's not about mitigation it's not about mitigation which is to which is to technically avoid no it's about resilience climate change is going to happen climate change is already happening and global warming is happening at a scale where it is going to reach that 1.5 degree Celsius and thereafter we believe there will be irreversible damage so it's not a very good report vis-a-vis -vis tone and its basic approach are we clear about the three things you need to remember for your mains examination first the tone of the report second the implications for India and third this concept of equitable action everybody has to act if if this is clear then we move to TB okay perfect now see the basic point is they've given up somehow we as a civilization humankind has given up on 1.5 degrees Celsius now TB a very very it's a curable disease but needs a lot of care and systematic systematic medication and if you leave leave the medication in between the dosage has to increase so tuberculosis is not it's a it's a fatal disease but is preventable it is a preventable disease it is communicable not not like COVID-19 but through the sputum itself through the droplets itself TB is a problem in the world TB is a problem in the world in India itself we have a sizable portion of the population which has TB but TB used to be a problem right now it can be mitigated however the way of mitigation is a little bit cumbersome now what this article technically talks about tomorrow is world TB day so it's a very well timed article it talks about we have been pushing as a community as the UN has been arguing that we will eradicate tuberculosis from the world soon and the concept is we will end TB by 2030 though it's a shifting goal post the concept was out of the three major diseases which were identified in 20, 2003 which is that one was AIDS which had a lot of emphasis the other one was malaria and the third one was TB see AIDS is an autoimmune disease it has a totally different form of understanding with regards to malaria and tuberculosis both we can mitigate it in such a way that fatalities can go down but what this article technically talks about that our response in the last 30 years has been very 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 slow not urgency there was no real urgency in that and it's been a long process and with this goal of end TB by 2030 we need to first define what do we mean by end and how do we verify this end of TB 
But for you and me, this becomes an important topic for GS paper 3 because now they can ask you how do you mitigate TB generally. Now first we need to understand what has been the road to mitigating tuberculosis as a disease. So there was a global fund which was created in 2003 called the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB and Malaria. And though it initially had a lot of emphasis on AIDS, the last 20 years this global fund has become a major channel of getting money for TB research and generally making sure that TB can be eradicated from the earth. And it is a very, very well managed disease if you have an institutional access to the medication. But because right now it is based on injections and very close monitoring, there's a lot of patients which give up in between. And the problem is that if TB medication, you go to a certain point and give it up, then that medication is not going to work. You have to have to shift to a different medication. So the Stop TB conference or partnership was actually created to make sure that everybody comes together and the best practices across the world can be followed to end TB itself. And with World TB Day on March 24th, and there's a meeting which is going to happen in Varasi tomorrow, this Stop TB board is going to meet and have a discussion. What this article technically is, is a solution. You have articles which are problems, you have articles which are solutions. This is a solution, solution based article. The solution it gives is that there are three areas in which we need to mitigate so as to make sure that we can meet this target of 2030. Now what are the three basic things which this article points out before we go into the very sim very small details. The three basic thing it points out is that first the way to eradicate tuberculosis or TB by 2030 is that we need to make sure that there is an adult vaccine. Right now, there's a TB vaccine, but it's close to 100 years old and is given to children. It's a vaccine which is given at birth and is only given in the 0 to 5 year period. But a lot of people don't either first get access to this, but later there is no adult vaccine. So there needs to be a vaccine which can be administered not just to children but to adults and there needs to be a way to incentivize research in that area. Second, it talks about the fact that there needs to be better medication, medication or medicine because as of right now the way we mitigate if you do get tuberculosis or TB is very very cumbersome with injections, no oral pills. The arg argument is that if we can get an oral pill or an oral medicine, we will be able to make the patient stay in the medication for long and patient fatigue will go away. And the third is the most interesting aspect which this article points out, which is that TB can be mitigated via now the use of AI or artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence based surveillance can lead to catching TB at an early stage itself. So the AI based surveillance and diagnostic techniques is something which the article is technically pushing. So first is detection, second is vaccine and third is medicine. Three areas if properly managed and technically mitigated into we can take we can simply and very easily make sure that we can meet this 2030, 2030 target of eradicating TB or stopping TB. So for you, this is a very interesting and important article because it gives you a lot of tangible and very solid arguments to be given in the examination. Because TB is something which is a major chronic disease in India. A lot of people don't even know if they have TB. And we need to make sure with regards to how COVID-19 has pointed out about the lung health and how respiratory tract infections can be major, major and dangerous. So therefore, TB can be removed. Let us eradicate it. Let us make sure that we can stop TB together. So therefore, 
the three key areas which the article technically points out first is that we need a adult tb vaccine it has been a long and very arduous process through which we have gone the current vaccine is a vaccine which is given at birth and is close to 100 years old it's a stable vaccine but we need an adult tb vaccine this is for prevention thereafter the second area is new therapeutic agents which is technically new medicine once you do get it we need to make sure that there is better medication wherein the concept is that we are not having the right right set of medicines which can be given orally so a oral pill regime regime or regi the the way we give medication is better than the injection based we have today and this could lead to better compliance and less of patient fatigue and last but not the least is the fact that we need to immediately integrate what we call as ai assisted hand held diagnostic tools such as radiology in which there is 90 second reporting 95 plus 95 percent plus accuracy and this can lead to very quick detection it can be rolled out very quickly it can be used to detect detect tb quickly and at an early stage just by interpreting the cuff sounds and by passive surveillance and generally via using ai we can actually provide people with reliable information so that they can mitigate and catch tb at the right moment so as to make sure that technology is used to mitigate detect and and also stop tb from spreading at a alarming rate so before i go to the third topic what is the basic point this is a very important article for your gs paper 3 these are very realistic questions which come you will not get this type of solution anywhere else in a random book that is why we read the newspaper three basic areas of intervention vaccine medicine ai based detection and diagnostics remember these three points if you can you will get you will get the maximum number amount of marks you can get in such type of question because you are not giving vague answer you are actually giving an established fact how do we mitigate it generally is this topic clear then we move to the third major which is russia and china come on okay now the third interesting topic is the spectacle which has hap which has been happening in russia for the past two days which is xi jinping or china and russia interacting in the context of what we see as ukraine now for us for us generally this is a very important moment because russia is an important ally is an important ally we have abstained from voting against russia quite a lot of times now and china is an irritant for us because of the ladakh sector the natural sector china has been aggressively trying to undercut indian presence and politics in the indian ocean world we have one small article with regards to the prelim solomon islands the same issue and china does not technically make sure or it does not recognize the territorial sovereignty and territorial integrity of india generally when it comes to pok or the cpec and the one belt one road initiative itself is trying to undercut india at all levels so here are two countries which are on the opposite spectrums one is a good ally all weather friend on the other hand china has been an enemy for a quite a long time now these two have come together and there are three major things which we see via this meeting first is that putin wanted china to buy more natural gas from russia but that technically did not materialize too much except for a proposed pipeline via mongolia what is more significant was their wording and what they were saying in the meeting itself 
the first thing was that both of them used a term which is technically a term which tries to undercut India generally because they use the word Asia Pacific rather than Indo Pacific. Now, this use of the word Asia in place of Indo was in a way trying to say that this Indian Ocean, the fact that Indo-Pacific means India has a very important role within this whole sector and using the word Asia Pacific was the first thing which China tried to do, which is to say that it is not the Indo-Pacific, it is the Asia Pacific. Second thing which it said was that there needs to be, there needs to be and it does not look good from China again. We did an article, same type of article yesterday, which is that it said that there should be no politicization of multilateral institutions. And that was a jibe on the quad, wherein, wherein India, US, Japan and Australia are trying to find a solution or trying to mitigate China within the Indo-Pacific and they are trying to say that multilateral institutions will, should not be based on politics. Whilst this bilateral institution and bilateral relationship is based on politics itself, politicization of multilateral institutions is something which they said is not acceptable and should not be there. Again, something hypocritical coming from China because that is what it does. And the third thing which it very directly wanted to say to the world is that the US has not been a good leader and NATO as of right now is perpetuating a lot of aggression in certain areas. Now herein comes the Russian angle. There are two basic things which China wanted to push. First this Asia Pacific concept and second Quad. While Russia wanted to say that NATO countries as of right now are showing a lot of aggression and the arms being supplied to Ukraine is an act of aggression. Now both these countries need each other right now but there is a very interesting relationship which has also developed between Russia and China in the sense that Russia has the technology but does not have the money and China has the money but not the technology and therefore there is a very close relationship of reverse engineering and generally technology transfer which is getting developed between Russia and China. And for us, it becomes a problematic aspect because whilst we, we are becoming more and more closer to America, again a moody power can, can betray us at any point of time. Russia is becoming more cozier to China, which was not the case previously. And whilst we cannot fully rely on America, Russia still remains a major defense partner. Now this means that for example, we develop Brahmos with Russia and if China gets access to Brahmos, it is undercutting Indian sovereignty and defense. So therefore, somehow our eyes were throughout this whole meeting were on Russia because if Russia pivots too much towards China, then India does not have the option, uh, does not have the option to fully go towards America because America has this concept of reciprocation or it dictates quite a lot because it says that you cannot abstain in the UN, be critical of, of Russia, but we cannot do that because we generally have a very good relationship and we have to in cultivated because our defense technology is based on Russian technology. Now this is the tightrope which India is walking right now. We want to develop a very independent form of foreign policy but this Russia-China coziness is something which has implications for India generally because if India goes into Quad but Quad has not materialized the way it should have so they always talk about strategy, strategy, strategy. One Malabar exercise cannot be enough to technically undercut the Chinese in South China Sea or Pacific. So therefore, India cannot fully rely on Quad. And at the same point of time, America is not ready to give most of its technology to India. 
and they are giving us obsolete technology, Chinook, and they are giving us the, the helicopters which they don't use now. Whilst we get the best technology and the latest technology from Russia. But Russia is now ready to give that technology and China is technically funding that technology which technically undercuts our own defense. So now we are technically caught up in a whirlwind. It's a very, very tight situation we are in because we can't let Russia become pro-China too much and we can't be pro-America too much because America, as I said, will say that you don't buy S-400 from Russia, they will not give us an alternative also. Now this is where India is in a tight spot. So remember that this is an ongoing concept and relationship. But India is getting caught up in the spot more and more because it can't fully pivot towards America. It can't fully allow Russia to pivot towards China because then China gets access to technology which we also have. China is literally funding Russian sp uh, space technology and more than that defense technology right now. So, the China-Russia relationship has blossomed in the past week or so with a long term blueprint for a deepened relationship and they are pushing back against the US Indo-Pacific strategy and politicization of multilateral institutions. For us, what is more important is what are the terms which they used for. First is that they said the, we firmly condemn the politicization of multilateral platforms and attempts of certain countries to fill the agenda of multilateral platforms with unrelated issues and dilute the primary vision. This is basically based on Quad. You can talk about BRICS also. You can talk about the, the way, the way SCO is also not been able to go for its full potentiality because of the, the way the bitterness between China and India somehow permeates this also, this also, this also. And generally they were critical of the NATO, that there are serious con concerns about NATO continuing and strengthening military security ties in now this word Asia Pacific countries which is that if NATO is creating a regime in which Asia Pacific and they are not using the word Indo-Pacific and this is a very strategic way of undercutting Indian interest that they are saying that if NATO becomes more and more aggressive in the Indian Ocean world we will also become more and more aggressive therefore both sides are trying to create block politics. This is the word which they use, which is called block politics. And we've not heard this word block for a quite a long time, since 1991. Basically, they're referring to how there's a cold war between, again, Russia and the NATO countries. And the way the word iron curtain has again come into vogue, which is that there's an iron curtain which has fallen. This is all cold war politics and cold war terms, which is an iron curtain between Russia, Ukraine and, and the NATO, Poland and all. Basically, Poland being a very important part of the NATO. And now, right now, Poland is getting ready for war itself. The basic point of the mat, the block politics, this word block politics again has been emphasized in order to say that don't create blocks. See, all this is just, just Russia and China trying to threaten the world. Ironically, they are the ones which are creating these block politics, but they are saying to us that you are doing it. The jibe on NATO is basically Russian politics. The Quad, BRICS, SCO and the multilateral politicization is Ajayab on India and generally these institutions, this is the China politics. The basic point of the matter is that this cold war type situation which we see right now is something which we've already seen between 1945 and 1991. However, this time there are not only two poles, there's no bipolarity, it's multipolarity which is multiple countries as of right now are trying to undercut each other. Now, as I said very simply for you, the purpose of this discussion is to understand two very basic things. First, how they are pushing against certain institutions. 
those institutions become important for you generally. And second is how this relationship has implications on India. The more important question is, does this relationship affect India? Yes, it does. Therefore, the economic partnership with regards to uh, Russia-China economic cooperation till 2030, close to 80 important agreements, close to 165 billion dollars worth of different economic projects were sanctioned. More oil, natural gas, LNG, coal and electricity will go to China from Russia. And, and Russia has been pushing for more and more export because with the economic sanctions on it from the European sector, though Europe is still buying a lot of Russian natural gas, they are trying to push for more LNG to be pushed to China. And they have proposed a, a pipeline via Mongolia between China and Russia. Now, before I go to prelims bites, three basic things we're discussing. First topic we discussed was the aspect related to the TB, how to stop TB, vaccine, medication, and AI diagnostics. Second was the IPCC report. IPCC report we discussed with regards to how we have already reached 1.1 degree Celsius and the way the tone of the report has totally changed. And the third topic we discussed, a major main topic is Russia, China and the implication with regards to India. Are these three basically clear? Then we move into the smaller topics with regards to prelims bites. These three clear? Yes? Perfect. Okay. Now, first small topic which we need to discuss is called the Cobra Warrior Exercise. And uh, the Indian Air Force has been part of it, has been a part of it. And uh, five Indian Air Force, Mirage 2000, 2000 aircraft have taken, taken part in what we call as the Cobra warrior exercise with the UK. Now for the purpose of the prelims examination, you just need to know two things. First, exercise Cobra warrior and it is with the UK. Though other countries have also took part in this with Finland, Sweden, South Africa, Saudi Arabia and the US along with Singapore. And we were initially planning that we will send the Tejas LCA. However, that has that is busy with another another exercise right now. So we send the Mirage 2000. The basic point of the matter is that Finland, India, Saudi Arabia have done this for the first time together. So it's a significant moment in that regard. So what you remember for the Prince examination is Cobra Warrior, UK and India sending Mirage 2000. The Tejas aircraft was considered first but it is busy and Finland, India, Saudi Arabia have come for the first time in an exercise together in that regard. So it's a very simple topic, don't have to complicate it, easy, have to just learn the name and the country with which we see, we see basic, basic exercise and cooperation. Then, the next is again a proposed topic wherein Chandrayaan 3 and Aditya L1 a very important, two very important projects of the ISRO are going to be launched by mid-2023. First is Chandrayaan-3. Chandrayaan-3 basically is our second attempt on landing a basic probe on the surface of the moon and then, then having a rover go around and do scientific research on the surface of the moon. So it's basically landing and having a rover landing and having a rover with regards to the lunar mission. Second is the Aditya L1 which is our solar mission in which we want to send a satellite called Aditya to go into Lagarde 1 which is L1, the word L1 is a point in which the satellite will always be looking towards the sun. It is about basically studying the sun, the sunspots and the magnetic field of the sun itself. So. Both are very interesting projects of the ISRO. However, as of right now, as of right now, we believe that they should be launched by mid-2023. So June, July, we will see it. It, it will be significant. Uh, Aditya L1 is in itself very important because it will be the second or the third project in the world to talk about and research about the sun itself. 
and second chandrayaan 3 will be our attempt to make sure that we can do what we were not able to do previously which is to land safely on the surface and then use a rover to do scientific research on the lunar surface itself thereafter thereafter with this year the international year of millets and millets being pushed in g20 summit itself and with india's presidency and india having a very resilient and very strong millets based agriculture sector itself with jowar bajra and ragi both being th all three being very well responding to climate change and generally india has an agriculture the right climate and already a lot of farming in these three therefore india has been pushing for millets quite a lot and now the indian army has said that what we had abandoned close to 50 years back which is to give millets into our rationing system of the soldiers we had replaced that with what is called white atta or wheat atta the atta will now be supplemented with basically millet flour so the union government has sanctioned the procurement of not exceeding 25 percent of authorized entitlement so if 100 percent of uh, rations are given 25 percent of that is going to be millets in that sense and rice and wheat flour will still be given rice will be given wheat flour will still be given but now from 2023 24 the indian army will reintroduce millet flour now again this is a small topic very not very important in the larger context but the basic point of the matter is this is the year of the millets india has been pushing millets india has the capacity to produce millets at a scale which can be profitable to our economy and generally agriculture and third with the indian army reintroducing millet flour be it the bajra jowar or ragi not exceeding 25 percent of the rations itself it is going to be a significant demand and a push which will allow millet production in india generally so what have we done till this point we've understood the how do you tackle tb then we've understood the concept of of the ipcc report and then russia and china now we've done two small topics the cobra warrior exercise and second millets being pushed into the indian army and reintroduction vis-a-vis -vis rice and wheat also now the no the, see, the noble prize is something which everybody follows but there's also one more prize which is given in mathematics which is called the able prize now again you don't have to go into nitty-gritty or understand the differential equations no for any pieces level examination or for UPSC, a basic ma match the following question can be asked from this section. Wherein the Abel Prize for Mathematics was awarded to whom? And it was awarded to basically an Argentinian American scholar called Louise Caffarelli. And she has been given this basic, basic award for how they have, they have experimented on the partial differential equations. Partial differential equations are very, very important for how you understand even water flow to population flow. And it is used in physics, economics, biology in variable change. So we don't need to know what are differential equations. Though if you are from, from an engineering background or mathemat mathematics background, you would know differential equations are important. But partial differential equations by, by Louis Caffarelli has allowed for the physics, economics and biology these three subjects to get more enriched and from explaining how water flows to population growth this is a major development for us so very small topics just have to remember the name that's it thereafter last but not the least a very interesting moment in u.s china relationship see in 2022 there was a major standoff between China and US over the Solomon Islands. The Solomon Islands actually went into a secret security pact with Beijing and the Americans asked the Solomon Islands that under this secret pact which was done without the consent of any other country, it is a secret pact, the diplomatic relationship between China and US got disturbed because there was an understanding of creating a naval 
port and a naval base within within Solomon Islands. Now, this is a very interesting way in which we can close this session that we're talking about Russia and China. China is looking for ports all across the Indian Ocean, which is called the string of pearls theory, which is that you create a whole dotting of ports in and around India. And therefore, therefore, you undercut Indian interest also and also Australian interest in the Indo-Pacific. The fact of the matter is that this Solomon Islands pivoting towards China and having a secret security pact would mean that China would get in the heart of the Indian Ocean a major naval base. However, this did create a tussle and there was a diplomatic assertion that no, we have gone into a security pact but there is no naval base. However, in the port of Hoinara, which is technically the capital of the Solomon Islands, Beijing based China based company has win has won a contract with regards to creating a port and port deal has been struck. So basically a state backed Chinese company has won a contract to develop a key port in the Solomon Islands which is Hoinara, Hoinara being the capital city itself. Now what is the implication for this for India because everything has to be seen with our perspective. This is a, again a little bit of a concerning development because thereafter it means that within the Indian Ocean, now there's again a port which is technically controlled by the Chinese. And the Solomon Islands which was a US, pro-US country now has be pivoted towards China because China is ready to push as much money as possible into that area. So though there is no naval base, indirectly they have created a sphere of influence. So before I go to the main question itself, I'll give you a basic revision or we'll just summarize everything we've done in this, in this class or in this video. First, we try to understand how the IPCC report, the tone has changed. It's not about mitigation, but resilience. Second, we understood how the TB, stop TB conference is going to happen very soon, tomorrow being World TB Day. And uh, basically, what are the three ways in which we can meet the target of ending TB in 2030? First being vaccines, an adult vaccine. Second being the aspect related to the concept of diagnostics based on AI. And third is medication which is based on oral pills. Third, we discussed the concept of China-Russia coziness implications for India. And thereafter, we've done five small but interesting topics. First, the Cobra Warrior ex ex what is called exercise between India and UK. But Finland, India and Saudi Arabia for the first time came together, Mirage 2000. Thereafter, Solomon Islands, how China has now indirectly won a major contract there. Thereafter, we understood millets being introduced into the, the diet of, of the Indian soldiers and now rationing system itself. And then we also understood how Chandrayaan-3 along with, along with the Aditya L1 satellite based project is going to be launched within this year. And all of these different small topics along with the ABLE prize for mathematics these are prelims oriented small topics which you can generally understand and you just have to learn the basic facts. But I hope that you can understand the larger arguments being pushed for the first three topics. If that is clear, then we'll look at the main question and end the session. Are we clear with regards to the first three topics and then the prelims oriented topics? Yes, we are. Great. Perfect. So the two main questions for two today is the road to ending the TB epidemic needs proactive intervention in key areas. Discuss. It's a very realistic question, a very representative question from GS Paper 3. You can easily do it. Thereafter, discuss how the Russia-China relationship impacts India's interest in the Indo-Pacific. This is also a GS Paper 2 very interesting question, but very realistic question for your larger preparation. So with this, I would like to end the session. Remember, we have a national scholarship test on Sunday. You can get close to 90% scholarship and a detailed report of your strengths and weaknesses. 
Thank you so much for your patience. I will see you tomorrow again with another set of issues. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.